Um, boy, I'll tell you, the song service, um, this last song especially, very appropriate for my message. So I really appreciate it. does a lot of good work. And uh, being led by the Spirit to make the right choices is an important part. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the love and the grace and the kindness that you've shown. We thank you for what you did on the cross for us. And Lord, as I speak today, I pray that you will open our hearts to hear directly from you. That you will allow me to hear from you as well. That you will speak the truth through me. That you will guide us all and help us to learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I'm going to be looking at um, one of the promises that God gave us. Uh, There's a book um, James McDonald wrote many years ago. Uh, He wrote it when uh, he was going through treatment for cancer, and it was a real hard time for him. And the name of the book was Always True, and there were five promises God made. And this is one of the promises. And And basically, the promise is, God is always victorious. I will not fail. Now, when you think about this and see it saying God is victorious, that implies, first of all, a battle. Secondly, a battle against an enemy. In this case, we have a real enemy. And God rescues us from that enemy. Before I start, I want to ask the kids, How many of you heard the Bible story about Jesus walking on the water? Show of hands. Oh, good. How many of you heard about Peter walking on the water? One, two. Okay. Do you think that's a real thing? No? Okay, I'm going to read it from the Bible. We're looking at Matthew 14, verses 28 to 33. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. This is when Jesus is walking on the water. And then verse 29, Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water. And he came toward Jesus. So he started out all right. He was walking on the water. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. So we see that Peter starts out all right, but then he lets doubt conquer him, his faith. And he cries out to Jesus, and Jesus saves him. Right now, we are living in perilous times. We see riots. We see people getting killed. We see churches being fined for holding worship services. In our own state, we see anti-Semitism directed at the Jewish communities in New York. All of this is being done with the pretense of protecting us. 
When Peter stepped out onto the boat and started walking on the water, at first it may have been thrilling until he saw the danger of the wind and the waves. That's when Peter panicked and started to sink. That's also when he cried, Lord, save me. As I'm looking around right now, I have a deep understanding of how Peter felt. I see all the things that are happening, and I'll tell you, it's scary. As a matter of fact, in just a few short months, we have seen our country change drastically. Where the catchphrase for 2020 is, the new normal. We are living in a time where no matter what direction we take, we will be walking into a hurricane force headwinds. And it seems there is no way we can succeed. In 1517, Martin Luther faced similar headwinds. After he wrote his 95 Thesis and wrote it as an invitation to discuss the practice of indulgences. What happened next was a firestorm that changed the world. As Luther was going through this fiery trial, he wrote a hymn that the church sings these 500 years later. I want to read the verses. I'm not going to try and sing it. I might break equipment. But anyway, the song is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Did you know that that was written by Martin Luther? And it says this, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is none his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God has willed. His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not at him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. And one little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That is a powerful song. I mean, it just, every time I go through it, it just sends thrills up and down my spine. In this culture, 
And this has been going on for centuries. Slowly, Satan has been slowly moving culture in this direction. But we have been brought up to think in terms of the material rather than the spiritual. One of the biggest lies we have fallen for is there is some sort of argument we can use to persuade others. Or barring that, there are means to enforce our will on others. The truth is, we have a real enemy who is armed with cruel hate. And he seeks to undo us. The weapons he uses might be things like guns and bombs, but most of what he uses are spiritual weapons. The big three, as I like to call it, are temptations to give in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He started that right off in the Garden of Eden, and he has been using that and using that and using that since man has ever existed. So we see we have an enemy, and God rescues us from the enemy. Now we will see that when God wins, it's an overwhelming victory. Ephesians six ten through 12, I'm going to read this. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. One thing that has impressed me this year is how quickly Satan can lay the entire world low. Our world has been devastated by a global pandemic. And it's, I mean, that virus has been a serious problem. But the fear that followed has been much more devastating than the virus itself. And everywhere we look, we see people afraid to walk out their door because of this. As I was preparing this message, it came to mind what John had talked about when he played the clip from the new Karate Kid. I saw how the young kid was rescued by his teacher who fought the battle. And I saw an analogy of how we are to fight our spiritual battles. If we fight them, we lose. If we ask Jesus to fight for us, we win. Yes, it is just that simple. Just as a kid watched as his teacher fought the battle, he couldn't win. But the teacher did. We are to watch our Lord and Savior who fights the battles for us, the ones we can't win. And you know what? That's all of them. Every single battle we get into, we can't win it. Martin Luther said it this way in A Mighty Fortress. Did we, in our own strength, confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath is his name from age to age the same. So we see that our battles are to be fought by someone else. Someone else who must win the battle. Remember the final battle when Moses delivered the Israelites from Egypt? 
They were all at the edge of the Red Sea. Egypt's army is bearing down on them. And this puts them in a panic. They start asking Moses if he brought them there to die. Exodus 14, 13 to 16 says this, But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today will never see, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel will go through the midst of the sea on dry ground. So God holds the Egyptian army back until the Israelites are on the other side of the Red Sea. Then he lets the army follow on dry land across the sea until they're in the right position to drown them all. And God then just lets go. And they are all drowned in the sea. See, God doesn't just barely eke out a victory. He wins with such overwhelming force it leaves no question that he is the victor. So far we've seen we have a real enemy and God rescues us and that God will win an overwhelming victory. Now we will see that God says, we are children of Abraham. God is not in the habit. Our God is in the habit. Oops, i to read my own writing. <laughs> God is in the habit of winning. And he promises to include us in that victory. As I read Isaiah 54, I can't help but think that this may have been Luther's inspiration to write a mighty force, or a mighty fortress is our God. At first blush, Isaiah 54 looks like it is addressed solely to Israel and a promised release from captivity. This is the primary understanding of this passage. The second, uh, secondary understanding is addressed to the church. First, I want to warn you, be very careful when you try to apply prophecy to the church. All sorts of strange and heretical doctrine may result. I want to read from Dwight Pentecost in his book, Things to Come. This book, um, the section is on the law of double reference with, pro with respect to prophecy. And I'm quoting, Few laws are more important to observe in the interpretation of prophetic scriptures than the law of double reference. Two events, widely separated, as to the time of their fulfillment, may be brought together into the scope of one prophecy. As a matter of fact, many of the um, messianic prophecies, the prophecies about Jesus, are also talking about events that are fairly close to when the prophets spoke the message. So there were two references, one referring to Israel and one referring to Jesus. Um, this is one that is different, though, and, and I'll get into that, but continuing the quote. 
This was done because the prophet had a message for his own day as well as for the future time. By bringing two widely separated events into the scope of the prophecy, both purposes could be fulfilled, Horn says. The same prophecies frequently have a double meaning and refer to different events, the one near, the other remote the one temporal, the other spiritual, or perhaps eternal. The prophets thus having several events in view, their expressions may be partly applicable to one and partly applicable to another. And it is not always easy to make the transitions. What has not been fulfilled in the first, we must apply to the second. And what has already been fulfilled, we may often cons may often be considered as typical of what remains to be accomplished. But even though there is this principle, and even though this is a valid principle of understanding the scriptures, it's not just enough to interpret Isaiah 54 this way just because it may look this way, or we may want it to look this way. We must always follow, must always follow the most important rule of understanding scriptures. We must compare scripture with scripture. That's always the case. It must agree with the rest of the scripture. In this case... In Galatians 4, 26 to 31, Paul is saying this. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate, than the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman. So Paul uses Isaiah 54, 1 as a foundation of his explanation that we who are children of faith are children of Jerusalem and of Abraham. So he's using Isaiah 54 to tell us that the promise made to Jerusalem and to Israel in the case of Isaiah 54 is also made to us. So we're not just pulling this out of thin air. We're not just looking at it in some way. It is scriptural. It is what the scriptures say. It's what Paul said in Galatians. And we've seen that we have a real enemy. And God wins with an overwhelming victory, and we are children of Jerusalem and Abraham. Now we will see that God's promises to include us in his victory as children of Abraham. And here we're getting into Isaiah 54. I want to read the whole chapter because um, it's not a long chapter, but it is important. And I'll tell you, as you read this, in some ways I think this sounds an awful lot like Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress. So let's read it, or... Isaiah 54, starting at verse 1. Shout for joy, O barren one, who have borne no child. 
break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, who has not travailed for the sons of the desolate, one who will be more numerous than the sons of married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Spare not, lengthen your cords, and lengthen your pegs. What he's getting at here is make room for more people. (laughs) For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations. You will. And will resettle in the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth. And the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your husband is your maker whose name is Lord of hosts and will redeem our and, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel who is called the God of all earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Like this, for this is like the days of Noah to me when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you. I'll tell you, that's pretty amazing to think about. And my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed, and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, antimony, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystal. Boy, I'll tell you, that's a pretty... Fortress, isn't it? (laughs) All these jewels. And your entire wall of precious stones. All your sons will be taught of the Lord. And the well-being of your sons will be great. In righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression. For you will not fear. And from terror, for it will not come near you. If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fall because of you. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of the coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin. No weapon Here's the big promise, the really big one here. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Nothing. Not guns, not bombs, not accusations. As a matter of fact, he gets in this. He says, every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. That's the key to this promise, is that there is nothing. As Martin Luther said, the body may, they may kill, but God's truth, or God's kingdom, 
abide still. Jesus said, don't be afraid of the person who can kill the body, but be afraid of the one who can kill the body and the soul in hell. So we see no weapon will work. And then it says here at the end of verse 17, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Notice how Paul uses verse 1 to argue that we are children of Jerusalem and of Abraham. And then here at the very end of Isaiah, the prophet himself says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. So Isaiah is saying this also, right here. Right here in this passage, he's saying, this is our heritage. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Think about this. These weapons are not things like guns. They are weapons or accusations to bring you into condemnation. The result is... they'll backfire. The result is the lies, the deceptions, the truth will be exposed. God will bring all things into the light. And those who accuse falsely will have to bear the punishment for false accusation. Ephesians 1, 11 to 14, in terms of us as Christians, in terms of us as the church, says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the plan of his will. So he's given us an inheritance And we're seeing part of that inheritance in Isaiah 54. To the end that he, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the first installment of our inheritance in regard to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So, when we become Christians, Paul is saying we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He actually, the Holy Spirit, comes into us. And as this seal of him being in us, he says it's the first installment. It is the earnest, as it says in the King James. Earnest is like a down payment. Um, When you go to purchase a house, you have to give them a certain amount of money for them to take the house off the market so that they will hold it and tell either you're approved for a loan or not. But that money you never get back. And in this case, God, Paul is saying here that that down payment reserves us for heaven. That down payment says, I am going to bring you all the way through. That down payment says, When I win the victory, or in this case on the cross, when I won the victory, you were included in that. So how can I be sure this promise is for me? Am I a servant of God because I do good things? 
Actually, the correct answer is, I do good things because I'm a servant of God. As a matter of fact, I can't do anything good unless I'm a servant of God. Am I a servant of God because I'm born into a Christian family or born in a certain country or belong to a specific church? Nicodemus was a teacher in Israel. He was born into the right family. Yet, Jesus said to him, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. So how do I enter the kingdom of God and inherit this promise? I need to understand I am a sinner in need of a savior. I need to come to Jesus and ask him, forgive me and make me a new person. I need to trust in what Jesus did on the cross because he paid for my sins. When he died on the cross, when he suffered that pain, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God which is what I deserved. He was punished for my sins. And he made it so that he could give me his righteousness so I could become a righteous person. So... Every one of us, I believe most of us here are believers, but every one of us has to ask ourselves, have we truly trusted in Christ? Have we come to Jesus and said, Lord, forgive me? That's something each one of us must ask. Each one of us must come to an understanding as to whether or not we did that. And it is important to understand that that's the only way to get to heaven. And it's not something you put off either because the Lord could come before I even finish this message. And when that happens, the opportunity is gone. So we need to understand now is the time for salvation. Now is the time to say, Lord, forgive me. It's nothing big. It's nothing in terms of any specific words or whatever. It's just, I need a Savior, Lord. Forgive me. And he will make you a new person. He will give you his righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have made this promise that you will always win the victory and that you will include us in that victory and that you have won it so overwhelmingly at the cross that you have made it possible for us to be raised from the dead and live forever. We just pray that you will help us to understand the implications of that victory and that anything else that goes on right now, no matter how scary things may look, you are the one that is in control of the kingdom we truly belong to. And we just pray that you'll help us to grow and to seek you out and to seek to be more like you and to seek to understand all that you've done for us and to trust in all that we can see of your promises in the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen.